What's going on everyone, my name's Tenebris Infinite, and here are my ultimate tips and tricks to the brand new Soviet machines that have dropped with the landfall update. I've been hands on with these machines for about a week now, and in that span of time, I've figured out how to totally dominate and destroy this menacing new foe in ways that are not just brutal, but fun as heck too. Before we jump into the tips and tricks though, I just want to take a second to give a shout out to my homies off at Systemic. N not just for the early shot at all of this, but for the crazy amount of effort and talent that made Landfall so huge. These new machines are the most excellent thing to be introduced to this game, and even though I'm about to show everyone how to thoroughly destroy these new machines, they're mega fun to fight. Seriously. Well done, Generation Zero Team. Now we're going to formulate this guide into a few sections here. Firstly, combat and components, where I'll be showing you dudes a couple different approaches you can take to these machines, as well as in-depth guides to all the components and unique effects targeting these components can have in the heat of combat. Then, we'll be talking about machine loadouts, and some of the more in-behind-the-scenes AI patterns you can look out for and take advantage of. Then, lastly, we'll be looking at some unique strategies these machines offer, as well as a brief explanation on how loot is working for them currently. So, let's jump into it! As the Soviet equivalent to the Grunt Unit, almost like a doggo or a seeker, taking down the Lynx shouldn't pose too much of an issue, but there are still a few things you'll want to keep in mind. First up are the flamethrowers, that can do pretty massive damage if you aren't on your toes. The circle strafe approach works very well for avoiding this attack, but as there's very minimal windup to its attack, which is actually a pretty common factor to most Soviet attacks, you'll have to really keep your ears peeled for that initial squeak noise before the flamethrower starts up. We'll be going into loadouts and stuff like that in more detail later on in this video, but next up, let's look at the burst rifle option for the Lynx. My personal arch nemesis on these little ball boyos, it's deadly accurate and rips off pretty steady chunks of health. With two or three going after you, it can actually get pretty deadly. Something to remember is that you'll usually only have maybe one or two machines firing at you at a time. So usually if you can figure out which one of these machines is the designated shooting machine, you can maybe potentially ignore it to focus on other machines or focus on taking it down and then moving through each uh, designated attacking machine. Their shots come in a pretty steady da-da-da kind of pattern, so if you can dodge maybe, you know, the last two shots or something like that, you can usually wind up getting away from the, you know, burst as the burst's happening. Always try to remember your terrain and the obstacles in your terrain when you're dealing with machines that have a high rate of fire. And lastly, for the grenade dudes, uh, they're pretty easy to dodge, actually, because their grenade is a mortar, so you can hear their grenade a lot of times much sooner than when the explosion's going to happen. So you just kind of need to be ready to jump when you hear the grenade fire off. These grenades, just like the Apocalypse Hunter's grenades, have the ability to knock you off your feet even if you have the steady feet perk unlocked. You can try to be all technical and go after components and disarm these guys and stuff, but usually that's nowhere close to being as efficient as literally just shooting them in the ball. Just like with most grunt units in the game, the brute force option usually is a little bit more efficient than trying to be tactile. Just like doggos with their fuel cell, but the difference is here is instead of aiming for this machine's fuel cell, you're just aiming for its primary method of getting around, which is the ball. You can usually get it done in one to two shots from the PVG, or just a handful of rounds from any sort of full automatic weapon. If you encounter a wolf that's dropped all of its links, you'll want to take a little bit of time and focus some of your efforts towards those links. 
Uh, with their multiple loadouts, with the grenade launchers knocking you on your feet, the flamethrowers coming in close, the saw blades, the burst rifle, everything like that, it's a lot to manage if you're going to just kind of try to leave them to the side. So don't treat these guys like ticks. Treat them like doggos and stuff and actually take care of them before you focus on the bigger machine. So let's take a moment to look at the Lynx components here just so you guys can have a good idea of where to shoot and what to shoot on these dudes. The most important component we all know is the fuel tank, and you can find the fuel tank as a small fuel tank, kind of like the Seekers, which is why I attribute these guys to Seekers. Uh, you can find that small fuel tank just sitting on the back end side in behind the ball here. And here we're getting a good front end shot of the components. Pretty much what you have is you have the small little slot at the front that houses their melee saw blade. You have the optics, uh, which is just the dot kind of sitting right in the middle of the guy. And then alongside that, you have like engine drives and stuff like that sitting in the back portion. Then, of course, there's the giant ball. Then for armor, which are all of the blue pieces that you see in the tech view, uh, for the armor, you have his shoulder mounted armor as well as uh, brakes and the guardrails and stuff like that. You can see here on this downed links where the optics are and where the slot is for that saw blade to pop out. But again, really, you don't need to be so tactile with it. You can usually just solve it with a single bullet. But if you want to, there's also the drive engines at the back. Drive engines are usually a good component to go after for some solid damage. Next up, let's take a look at the wolf. And this first tip is one you're probably already gonna do. But take advantage of the sway of combat. Sit back, pick sides, and really get into this machine in fighting. It's a ton of fun when you bet on a side and it wins, or you come in for the unfair advantage, and no matter what, you profit out the end of it. But when it comes to fighting the wolf, once the machine infighting's over and you've taken care of its Lynx squad, are very much like harvesters. They're very weak from behind and especially inside of their kind of like hollow shell. You can disable their movement by uh, focusing on the core drives that are inside of their treads at each of the kind of blocked off and heavily armored section. Uh, you can see here that once you rip the plating off, you can see uh, the components being active. And the components need to be actually active for you to damage them, which is very interesting. It's, it's unique in Generation Zero as far as components go. Really, the best way to engage the wolf is up close and personal from the inside. But when you're engaging the wolf from, the, from a distance, there are a bunch of things to keep in mind. First of all, if the wolf is in its mobile form, you can shoot straight down the tank treads with the experimental PVG and damage those core drives right off the bat and actually get multiple of them in a row. Secondly is missile travel time and how long it takes for the missiles to get over to you. Uh, if you keep this in mind with your distance away from the enemy, you can actually predict the missiles pretty efficiently and dodge essentially the entire cluster. The thing is about the wolf is, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. With the wolves, they have a ton of components that you can seek out. And even when you're using something with very, very low penetration, like a hunting rifle with soft point or hollow point ammunition, you can still, like, do seriously, seriously crazy damage to these machines just by targeting specific components along the way. Components like the nanotech uh, recovery field emitter, the gas emitters, the missile launchers, the Gatling gun will all do really serious damage to this machine and uh, all of them are listed as proper components so soft point ammunition and hollow point ammunition does serious damage to them. When you're dealing with the Gatling gun you can't really avoid it. It's super difficult to avoid, even with circle strafing, all of that stuff. It's much easier to try to put some sort of an obstacle in between you and that Gatling gun. 
in order to try to survive it. As well, it will out damage any healing kits or health kits that you have. So really, you want to find a big rock or a sturdy Swedish tree to put between yourself and that Gatling gun. Destroying things like the poison gas emitters, which are the two tubes that sit on the outside of its body, or the electroshock, uh, ooh, the, the electroshock generator things, which are kind of two circles that will sit in the same spot that the poison gas, uh, emitters sit at, uh, is a very high priority because the moment you get rid of the other weapons on this machine, it will start making very liberal use of those weapons, the closer range options. For the Gatling gun, if you're trying to shoot between the legs, it's a jumble of hitboxes and really isn't your best option. You really want to wait until you have a very clear shot on that Gatling gun, unless if you're using something with obscene penetration like the experimental PVG. Then just blast away, dude. With using just a bit of effective cover and some focus on select components, these big boyos wind up becoming a cakewalk, even with soft point ammunition. So as I've been saying along the way here, the best way of dealing with wolves is up close and personal. And the way you want to make this happen is by proning up to the machine to a point where you're close enough that you can just make a really quick short sprint to get underneath that shell and start attacking all of the components on the inside. This is a really, really devastating strategy to pull off against the wolves and Honestly, it works like 9.9 .9 times out of 10. Once you're done savaging up the components on the inside of the shell, taking down the wolf from that point on is pretty easy. I'd like to call this wolf rodeoing. Let me know what you think of that name in the comments down below. I don't know if I'm quite vibing with it just yet. But you can take this to an even further level when you start introducing in the experimental sledgehammer with its charge electroshock Thor thunder attack. Absolutely destroys the machine alongside paralyzing it in the process so you can take even further advantage of the damage that you've done. As well, when you're using this close range combat approach to the wolf, you can make further advantage of the wolf as a form of protection. And this is something that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on in the video here. And if you find that you're running out of components on the inside of this guy to destroy, you could just turn around to one of the tank treads and rip those apart. Now this really only works when the wolf is in tank mode, not so much in assault mode because that Gatling gun is able to pivot uh, 360 degrees and target you wherever you're at underneath the wolf. As well, when the wolf's in assault mode, it has a similar pincer stomp attack to the harvesters and that can be pretty dang devastating. Lastly, for avoiding that dang Gatling gun, the biggest cue you have for this is the whir whirring and kind of winding up sound of the Gatling gun. That high-pitched whirring noise is pretty much your last half a second to find some sort of cover to block yourself and uh, try to avoid the onslaught of bullets. It's a pretty noticeable audio cue once you start to get used to, like, kind of anticipating it. The thing in Generation Zero is that there's always kind of this rhythm to combat, and once you start to get into that rhythm, you can start to anticipate some of these attacks a little bit easier. So now let's take a peek at some of the components on the wolf here, and first off is the shifting module. That's what shifts it into assault mode from tank mode. Next up, we've got the optics, which is kind of this little ball sitting right down at the front of him. Uh, coming around to the back end side here, we've got the fuel tank, which is uh, the kind of big old engine sitting in the back of him here. Uh, as well, there's like radiators and hardpoint batteries and core drives and stuff in here. It's very much a cluster of components right in this central portion of uh, 
of the wolf when he's in tank mode. Showing off some of these uh, hardpoint batteries here. Core drives and hardpoint batteries will do a ton of damage to these machines. Taking a look down at the treads, we can see that there is a core drive inside of pretty much all of these uh, tank treads, as I have been telling you dudes earlier. And so the idea is, is to take out those core drives in order to limit the mobility of the wolf. But sometimes that will just kind of wind up popping him up into assault mode, which you might not want, all depending on the scenario. And lastly here for when he's in assault mode, essentially when he extends upwards from tank mode to assault mode, all of those interior components that we were attacking on the inside of the shell now get shifted down to a, a kind of inner torso point where you also have the optics and all of that other stuff and the Gatling gun hanging down beneath. With so many options on such a big target, it's all just about figuring out what components you want to go for. Maybe you want to go for the neurotoxin dispenser first so that that way he can't get you with the farty gas. Or you maybe want to go for the recovery field emitter so that that way he's not healing himself and other machines. Or you could go for the rocket salvo if you are potentially uh, in a scenario where you're able to block bullets but not so much explosions. Or vice versa taking out the minigun if that's your arch nemesis. Really, you'll probably be surprised at how fast the wolves go down when you take their components into consideration. Alright dudes, so let's really quickly take a look at the blueprints for the Lynx before we move on to the Wolf here, so that we could talk a little bit about the loadouts, what you experience with different classes of Lynx, and uh, some of the kind of AI patterns that go alongside these loadouts. The blueprints have a small readout that develops along each class, starting at Scout, then moving to Soldier, and then ending at Spetsnaz. So I'm just going to read out the Spetsnaz readout because it's all of the other two just combined together with a little bit extra added in specific for the Spetsnaz here. As well, currently the blueprints don't effectively show the color schematic of the machines. It goes green for the Scout, it goes a uh, kind of faded orange color for the soldier, and then it goes to a white color for the Spetsnaz. It's kind of like a winter camo looking print. It's, it's very sick actually, I dig it. So uh, the readout is, this machine typically moves in groups of four and can quickly create strategies based on the flow of battle. Lynxes can travel on all sorts of terrain due to their large gyroscope. A unique locomotion technology responsible for their swift and unpredictable movement. The sphere is protected by two prominent steel railings as well as other pieces of armor plating. Two rear mounted diesel engines supply the Lynx's horsepower while a front facing sensory organ provides environmental and tactical information. The Special Forces unit sports a classic winter camo and a sphere with chains to move on snowy grounds. Its loadout includes all of the weapons equipped on other models, but the addition of a fearsome flamethrower as well as reinforced armor plating make this particular version a force to be reckoned with. We've already covered the Lynx's loadouts pretty thoroughly so far, but just to go over them again, it's the Burst Assault Rifle, the Grenade Launcher, the Flamethrower, and the Saw Blade. But an interesting thing to take note of with the Soviet machines in comparison to uh, our typical Phoenix machines here is that they work in tandem much more effectively and you can see some very interesting strategies unfold. When you encounter a group of Lynx, usually what you'll get are the assault rifle dudes kind of hanging out at around a mid-range distance, occasionally closing in for a melee attack with the saw blade, whereas the grenade launchers will hang out more at the kind of back end of the pack, lobbing grenades at you from a distance, whereas the flamethrower dudes will come in very, very close to you, trying to get at you with the saw blade and the flamethrower kind of both at the same time. 
Now for the wolf, we're going to go through the readout and again its loadout and then we'll talk a little bit about the strategies that it employs with the lynx. Designed to transport and deploy infantry machines of the Soviet military, the wolf is often utilized during the first stages of an invasion. However, as a result of its remarkable loadouts, this machine is a mighty opponent in its own right. A missile launcher on each side of the body, toxic gas attack, and a menacing Gatling gun provide the offensive power necessary to deal with enemies at all kinds of ranges. In tank mode, wolf machines travel alone carrying four lynxes of the same class packed into their hollow body. After deploying the lynxes, the wolf may transition to assault mode a stance of increased mobility which exposes the deadly Gatling gun, but also most of the machine's vital organs. The Special Forces unit sports a classic winter camo and heavily reinforced armor. Its loadout includes all the weapons equipped on other models, with addition of a charged shock pulse, a weapon that inflicts high electric damage to nearby enemies, and cluster mines, a short-range but highly damaging explosive. Now for the missile launcher, we've covered how you can avoid that at medium ranges and then when you're at closer ranges to utilize cover. For the toxic da gas dispersal, again we've covered that it's these little canisters on the sides of the machine that you can take off in order to get rid of that gas attack. For the Lynx deployment, we've also talked about that and the Gatling gun as well. Uh, again, this is mostly only able to be targeted when the machine is in assault mode, but you can also get it when it's in tank mode if it has the nanotech recovery field. Now, the nanotech recovery field, this is where we're going to talk about how it works more in tandem with other machines, essentially allows the wolf to turn the uh, links that it's teamed up with into essentially an inv invincible army. And for the wolf, if the component is not fully destroyed, it will also recover that component's health on itself. Next up, we've got the cluster mines, and these again work in tandem with the lynx. So what the wolf will do is it will lay out the cluster mines, and then the lynx that launches the grenades, the cluster grenades, will wind up exploding all of the cluster mines, kind of igniting the entire battlefield on you. And lastly, we've got the Charged Shock Pulse, which is a very, very deadly close-range attack, but again, just like the gas-mounted uh, gas dispersal, you're able to take it off by targeting these components on the side. So before we wrap up with a short loot summary, I thought I'd leave you dudes with one last bit of fun tech here. Using wolf shells, lynx balls, and wolf set pieces as forms of cover. The Lynx Gyro Balls are awesome forms of cover that you can roll and maneuver to use as cover from incoming gunfire. Using these can sometimes give you the moment you need to heal, but you'll still need to be aware of explosive and mortar based machines. There also totally is the opportunity for Lynx Soccer or Lynx Football to wind up being a thing here in Generation Zero, so I, I'm gonna be testing that. And then Wolf Shells. These are a little bit more efficient as forms of cover from the set piece wolves as opposed to the wolf machines that you down out in the field. But you can utilize the shell from both the wolves you down in the field and the set piece wolves as excellent sources of cover. Large explosions will still manage to get you, but the wolf set pieces will protect you from a ton of incoming gunfire. And the moving mobile wolf enemies that you take down will also provide excellent sources of cover from all sorts of gunfire, just they don't provide as much cover from the explosives. Still though, these forms of cover can be absolutely massive, especially when you need a second to heal, or swap around your inventory, or reload your weapon wheel, or whatever the heck you need to do in the middle of combat here. Lastly here, let's talk about loot. So, 
for the wolf set pieces, we've now been given one of the most ultimate forms of loot in this game. These wolf set pieces are awesome. It's like a free tank, basically. These guys are just scout class, so you aren't going to be getting like crazy weapon drops off of them or anything like that. But still, you'll be able to get like advanced med kits and huge drops of ammo. In terms of regular wolves and lynx though, not set pieces, they're still pretty dang good. Spetsnaz wolves will offer you 5 crown weapons, whereas the Spetsnaz lynx will offer you advanced med kits. Uh, they, it kind of slides the scale on whether or not you're going to get advanced or standard med kits from these guys, but still, having the opportunity to get advanced med kits from grunt type enemies is really great. And in terms of rival loot, they just drop your typical rival loot. Hopefully though, someday in the future we can potentially see these Soviet machines taken advantage of loot pool wise to offer us new weapons and new unique things, especially along the aspect of rivals. So there you dudes go, a crazy in-depth guide of everything you'd ever want to know about the Soviet machines. From tactics to tech, loot to components, and some fun stuff I've worked out in the meantime. So hopefully this guide helped you out. If it did, hit that thumbs up button, and if you're new around here, consider sticking around by hitting that subscribe button. We have so much more to go into here, my dudes, but that can all wait for future videos. For now, Cheers, thank you for watching, and I will catch you all in the next one. Until then, peace.